Good evening, everybody. I'm Dr. Michelle Whitcup, the head of research at the National Hemophilia Foundation. Along with my colleagues, I would like to welcome you to the National Hemophilia Foundation's webinar, Gene Therapy, Getting Up to Speed. We are really excited to have so many of you join us this evening. As always, we need to address some housekeeping issues first. You are all on mute, but you do have the ability to submit questions throughout the webinar. You can do that via the chat box. There will be a 30-minute Q&A after Dr. Pipe completes his presentation. Many questions have already been received and forwarded to Dr. Pipe. He will address most of these during his presentation or during the Q&A session. If you experience any technical difficulties, you can either use the chat box or email us at genetherapy at hemophilia.org for assistance. That email address is on your screen. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on our website under future therapies. That website is hemophilia.org. With that, we do have a couple of polling questions that we would like to start out with. And these are anonymous. I'm going to pull them up real quickly. Hopefully you can see these on your screen. And there are three of them. So if you can take a minute and on your computer, just answer the questions. First, what is your current treatment regimen? And we do offer options in case you are not um, somebody who is on a treatment regimen. Next is, would you consider gene therapy as a treatment option for you or your family member? who has a bleeding disorder. And then third, why would you not, if not, why would you not choose gene therapy as a treatment option? We're just trying to get a sense of what people's thoughts are out there. So we're gonna give this a couple of minutes. We have a good amount of people. For those people who are just signing on, I'm gonna go over again and say that you are all muted. You can scroll down through the questions. You're all muted. You have the ability to submit questions throughout the webinar. You can do that via chat box. And there's going to be a 30 minute question and answer after Dr. Pipe completes his presentation. If you have any technical difficulties, you can reach us through the chat box or email us at genetherapy at hemophilia.org. This webinar is being recorded and we do have um, some polling questions. It looks like it's slowing down a bit. Just another minute or two, see if anybody else has the wants to answer. Okay. All right, we'll go ahead and we'll close this right now. And I'll just share with you what this looks like. There were, I believe there were about 67 people who had responded uh, as to what their current therapies are. Um, right now, the majority are not on any treatment. Um, would you consider gene therapy? Here, let me... Um, I'm having some problems scrolling myself on this. Would you consider gene therapy for a family member? And about 30% said yes. Let me see. 
Um, a few said no, and others prefer to wait and see. And then what are the barriers to um, treatment and too early to determine? So hopefully we're going to um, we're going to get some of those um, answers today from Dr. Um, Pipe. Our goal this evening is to present information on gene therapy in a very unbiased manner so consumers can make educated decisions. The response to our gene therapy session at the Anaheim Bleeding Disorder Conference was overwhelming. So Dr. Pipe graciously agreed to present this webinar in follow-up. Dr. Stephen Pipe is a professor at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, and the Lawrence A. Boxer Research Professor of Pediatrics and Professor of Pathology. He is the Medical Director of the Pediatric Hemophilia and Coagulation Disorders Program, as well as the Medical Director of the Special Coagulation Laboratory. His clinical interests include bleeding and thrombotic disorders and congenital vascular anomalies. Dr. Pipe also directs a basic research lab investigating coagulation factor VIII and the molecular mechanisms of hemophilia A. He has been actively involved in clinical trials with novel therapeutics for hemophilia, including gene therapy. He was a 2015 recipient of the Leadership in Research Award from the National Hemophilia Foundation. His service to the bleeding disorder community includes membership on the board of directors for the Hemostasis and Thrombosis Research Society, chair of the board of directors for the American Thrombosis and Hemostasis Network, and he currently serves as the chair of the Medical and Scientific Advisory Committee to the National Hemophilia Foundation. So with that, I am going to turn over the um, screen to Dr. Pipe. Well, thank you, Michelle. And uh, uh, warm welcome to everyone who's uh, had a chance to join me this evening, um, whether it's evening or afternoon, uh, wherever you're at. I'm excited to give this presentation on gene therapy, uh, getting up to speed. And uh, I, I just have to present these disclosures just to let you know that I have uh, served on some of the steering committees for some of the clinical trials that we're going to be talking about um, and have served as a, on a, as a consultant to a number of these programs. I want to cover four main topics with you this evening. Um, anytime there's a, a brand new therapy, um, uh, it's important for us to recognize that there are fears and there are prejudices and there are hope. And I want to touch on a few of those as they relate to these kinds of genetic revolutions. We're going to talk about the overall landscape of hemophilia therapeutics, past, present, and future that have brought us to this point some of the trends in modern hemophilia therapy that I'm sure many of you are already uh, benefiting from. And then we really want to get to the question of why should we be considering gene therapy with all of the other advances that are happening with modern therapeutics? What is, what is the promise of gene therapy? And uh, uh, what I hope to leave you with is to show you that gene therapy is now a, a reality and it's going to be coming to a clinic near you. So I think it's helpful to remember that we have been through previous gen genetic revolutions before. And the one that is uh, most um, in my mind, uh, in, my, in my lifespan, was uh, the so-called test tube baby. So this is a Time magazine cover from 1978. And at this point, the technology had been there, but nobody knew or had ever seen a baby who had been born who was a test tube baby. And of course, all kinds of fears and prejudices uh, grew out of this uh, new technology. Um, people had this vision of, test, of babies actually growing inside test tubes, and people had these uh, horrifying views of you know, rows and rows of babies growing in laboratories. But we now know that this technology involves a uh, uh, simple but elegant uh, procedure of taking uh, a sperm and, in, uh, and injecting it into a, uh, an ovum. And then this leads to a fertilized embryo, which is then implanted uh, back into a recipient mother who's able to uh, carry that uh, pregnancy to term. <clears throat> 
But people really didn't wrap their minds around this um, until they actually saw a child who was the product of in vitro fertilization. And this is the first American, this was Elizabeth Carr, this is the cover of Life magazine just a few years later. And once people saw that this was a reality and once, once this became incorporated into routine medical practice, it really became a, a, adopted as, as what is now a routine a technology and literally millions of families around the world have uh, benefited from this technology. Well fast forward um, you know uh, 30 almost 40 years and uh, people are still having some uh, um, prejudices even <laughs> related to this technology. Um, some people are still concerned that you can actually do a lot of selection as it relates to uh, in vitro fertilization. And so this idea of sort of designer babies uh, by choosing qualities based on the sperm donor or where the uh, egg come from. So we're still dealing with some of these uh, uh, challenges in, in ethics um, as it relates to these technologies. Um, even as it relates to gene therapy, people have had uh, um, thoughts about, well, could gene therapy actually be used to, you know, in this, in this article, raise the prospect of genetically modified athletes? Um, certainly, you know, this has some possibility related to the techniques uh, that we have, but you can see these are the types of fears and prejudices that people are, are talking about. Now, one thing we need to uh, settle as, as it comes to just any discussion on gene therapy is an important difference, and, and if you've heard these terms before, it has to do with the difference between somatic and germline gene therapy. So what is gene therapy? Gene therapy attempts to treat a disease at its origin at the molecular level. So we're deliberately introducing genes into human cells to compensate for a gene that is defective, that causes a genetic disease. Um, when we're talking about gene therapy, always we're talking about somatic gene therapy. And in this case, we are only affecting the cells of the individual who is being treated. Germline refers to those cells that if they were modified, would be capable of being passed on to the individual's offspring. None of the gene therapy platforms exist are, uh, are targeting uh, the germline cells. We're only modifying the cells of the individual um, who, in this case, you know, has hemophilia. But that's true for all of the other disease targets as well. And I think this has been some confusion when I've talked to some families. They've had the perception that, you know, well, if I have gene therapy, does that mean hemophilia is eradicated from my family line? And, th and that's absolutely not the case. The public perception um, uh, can be influenced by rumor, confusion, over-exaggeration, and this sometimes spills over to moral and even uh, religious debates. The biggest fear of gene manipulation is genetic engineering toward the making of so-called superior individuals, the creating of a perfect being. But it's interesting, th these are some surveys that are, you know, are fairly old now, but a public opinion survey from um, uh, you know, essentially uh, 17 years ago showed that 42% of individuals would support gene therapy if it had a chance of improving their child's IQ, and 43% would support gene therapy to improve physical characteristics. So you can see that even the, the public conversation um, is changing over time. Now, I have to say, um, even though I'm a fan of science fiction, sometimes science fiction doesn't science fiction doesn't do us any favors and it can sometimes even give gene therapy a bad rap. Um, now, I love this movie, but um, this is a, a modern reboot of uh, the uh, uh, Planet of the Apes series. And in this, uh, in this movie depiction, the scientists were using a retrovirus gene therapy uh, delivery vehicle that was engineered to treat Alzheimer's. And it was showing powerful cognitive enhancing properties, showed some promise in apes and in a lone Alzheimer patient. But then they decided to crank it up to a more powerful variant well, what happens and ensues in the movie is that it, it proves to be fatal to humans, uh, but not to the apes. Somehow the, the virus escapes into the wild. There's a global pandemic 
it's interesting that we're talking about pandemics these days. The pandemic wipes out most of the humans, but these enhanced apes are then able to, uh, to take over the world. Well, that's, that's uh, obviously lots of fun for a science fiction depiction, but unfortunately it, it, it creates a lot of uh, misconceptions about gene therapy. And what I'm going to show you is that we are not using viruses for gene therapy. We're using uh, vectors. They've been stripped of their uh, viral genes, and they're really just um, delivery packages for the for the gene that uh, treats the uh, condition but we also have some um, uh, gene therapy has some dark history that we have to recall and this is dramatically influenced uh, the adoption of gene therapy not just for hemophilia but uh, across uh, the world and other platforms as well this was a gene therapy uh, experiment um, that was uh, conducted in the late 1990s. It was for a very uh, devastating um, uh, disorder. It's an enzyme deficiency where uh, patients would get uh, uh, deathly ill. And uh, the uh, therapy involved using what was a adenovirus um, as the carrier. And unfortunately, this boy, Jesse Gelsinger, um, ended up having a severe systemic immune response to the carrier vehicle, the adenovirus in this case, and he went into multi-organ failure about four days after starting treatment and died. And this had a ripple effect across gene therapy about how it's conducted, the types of vectors we should be uh, looking at, etc. cetera. Um, but there were still some other events that have dramatically impact uh, gene therapy. Um, you may have heard this as well. This was a, uh, a series of studies that was um, done to treat uh, inherited um, immunodeficiency, uh, life-threatening and uh, rare but devastating immune disorder. Um, and this uh, technology used a type of what are called gamma retroviruses. Um, and it did have the effect of, of restoring the immune system in these individuals. But unfortunately, the, the mechanism of action of these retroviruses is that they integrated into the genome of the cells. And unfortunately, um, in this particular experiment, they activated a cancer-causing gene and it caused uh, some leukemias in some of the patients who received this treatment. So again, this also had ripple effects on uh, the types of platforms that are used for gene therapy and how we monitor for, uh, for safety. But if we fast forward to today, just as we had with the in vitro fertilization, once people have seen the faces of the children and the families who've been affected um, by transformative gene therapy, it's really remarkable. Um, this is a recently approved uh, treatment for uh, uh, what is otherwise a devastating uh, neuromuscular disease called spinal muscular atrophy. This family had already lost one child uh, to SMA. They enrolled uh, their daughter Evelyn into a gene therapy trial, and you can see that she's been able to thrive after that treatment. Um, this is another article about a, a young man who has a devastating uh, genetic uh, disease with uh, will put him at risk for a, um, a terrible uh, disabling degenerative brain disease. But with gene therapy, he's now going to be able to stave off uh, that disorder. Um, this is something that's become a reality. I, I work in uh, pediatric hematology and oncology, and uh, uh, so-called CAR T-cell uh, therapy is transforming how we manage uh, patients with refractory leukemias. In this case, um, the patient's own cells are harvested. They undergo a, a gene therapy transformation in a facility, and then their own immune cells are given back to them, and these enhanced immune cells are able to attack the leukemia and hopefully uh, eradicate the disease. This has now been quite commonplace in how we, we treat leukemias now. And then uh, this is another important one. This is a young man who has a, uh, a type of uh, a rare hereditary blindness, uh, but with a gene therapy that's delivered directly to his retina, he's able to uh, restore and preserve his sight. So I, I think for, for myself, um, you know, seeing the faces and the families who are being transformed by gene therapy makes all the difference in understanding what the potential of this uh, transformative therapy can be.
So, but why, I, I talked to you a lot about some uh, diseases that um, really don't have any other uh, possible therapies in some cases. Um, so why should we be considering gene therapy for hemophilia? Well, let, let's go back to the hallmark of hemophilia, which is bleeding into joints. 90% of all the bleeding episodes that we manage in patients with severe hemophilia, so patients who have a factor 8 or a factor 9 that's less than 1% residual factor in their plasma, 90% of these events are into joints. Why is joint bleeding so devastating? Well, not just because it hurts with an acute bleed, uh, but when you bleed into the same joint, you um, irritate the uh, synovium, which is normally a very thin lining uh, that coats the inside of the joint. Um, this sin sin the inflammation of the synovium causes it to thicken. Um, it, um, it, it develops um, invaginations and fronds, and um, it has a secretory function. It starts to degrade the cartilage in the joint, um, and and it's damaged itself by the blood that's in, in the joint. Um, this eventually leads to a chronically boggy uh, joint that's indicated in the picture in the middle. And over time, that cartilage degradation goes on to bony uh, uh, degradation and uh, you're left with a hemophilic arthropathy, a significantly impaired uh, joint that has lost much of its function. This was the destiny for all boys and men with hemophilia until we had effective therapies. So um, how far back do we have to look before we had effective treatments? Well, in relative terms, it wasn't that long ago. The pre-replacement therapy era um, really uh, only goes back to the late 1960s. And up until this point, the only way to treat hemophilia was, was just supportive care, pain relief. Um, uh, boys and men from that era talk about sitting in hospital beds or on couches in their homes and uh, looking out the window and uh, taking days and sometimes weeks to recover from their bleeds. But with the ability to extract and purify the factor eight and factor nine from plasma, we had the first wave of plasma plasma-derived therapies, and that allowed us to do what we call on-demand treatment, which was to put these products in the hands of the patients and the families so they could treat as, as quickly as possible when there was a bleed at home. Um, but we quickly learned over the subsequent decades that if we didn't prevent bleeding altogether, joint disease still occurs. And so the prophylactic era was pioneered um, over in Sweden, and it was adopted really full bore in uh, the developing world and in the U.S. from about the uh, early 1990s. Um, now, we've gone through some uh, uh, iterations of, of improvement in, in some of the therapies. We've uh, been able to greatly enhance the production of uh, factor eight and factor nine through recombinant technology, and the majority of individuals now use recombinant products. And in recent years, we've done some enhancements to those, those molecules through bioengineering to enhance their half-life. So we've talked about plasma-derived factors and the recombinant factors, um, moving from the unmodified factors to the bioengineered. And so what has that resulted for patients? Well, um, we do a good job in preventing bleeding, and there's no question that prophylaxis um, is the only mechanism we've really had for the last couple decades to prevent, uh, try to prevent joint disease. But still, if we look at patients who are on good prophylaxis, and these are from public uh, studies where patients are receiving factor eight on a regular basis as part of prophylaxis, both with standard half-life molecules as well as uh, extended half-life molecules. And what we can see is that bleed rates are not zero. So the, we use a, uh, a, a term called annualized bleed rate. So if you had one bleed every six months, your annualized bleed rate would be two, actually. And so you can see that there's quite a range of, of uh, bleed rates that people still experience on whether they're on standard half-life or extended half-life. And if we look at the percentage of participants who experience zero bleeding over the course of a year, it's still the minor minority. Um, at least half or more of all of our patients are still bleeding on an annual basis. And that's every year for every decade 
uh, for their whole life. And we know that this is still resulting in joint disease. We know this from a number of different uh, outcome studies. The US Joint Outcome Study, um, they um, did very early looks at boys who were on treated on demand or on prophylaxis. And curiously, they were able to identify joints that clearly had evidence of pathology, even though the patients and the families had never recognized that there had ever been any bleeding into those joints. And so this is consistent with repeated so-called microbleeds into those joints. Um, there was a study in Canada called the Canadian Dose Escalation Study. And what they did is they started patients on a standard prophylactic schedule of about once a week. And then uh, if they had a certain number of breakthrough bleeds, they would increase them to twice a week and then three times a week or every other day. But from that study, we also learned some important points. Uh, they also did MRI follow-up on the boys who participated in this study, and they found soft tissue changes in a third of the index joints. So index, index joints would be ankles, knees, elbows. And um, these joints had no history of any clinically reported bleeding. Hemosiderin is a breakdown product of blood, and they detected um, this breakdown product in a quarter of the so-called bleed-free joints, joints that the parents or the, the individuals had never identified any recognizable bleeding. We have long-term uh, you know, uh, follow-up over multiple decades from the Centers for Disease Control Surveillance data that we collect through the hemophilia treatment centers. That's showing that we have not eradicated joint disease even in men from uh, the uh, 1990s who really have been on primary prophylaxis since a young age. And uh, even a study from uh, Randy Curtis's group, um, the so-called hemophilia utilization group studies or HUG studies, these have also shown us the same uh, type of outcome. So there's still plenty of room for improvement. So what really is the, the root cause of the continued uh, risk for breakthrough bleeding with traditional replacement therapy? Well, as some of you may know, right after you give an infusion, you get a peak within really a few minutes after that infusion. But as soon as that infusion is done, based on the, the half-life or the, the, the length of time that the the factor stays in your system, it starts to drop uh, in, in your blood level quite quickly. And you can be maintained in a reasonable range uh, for many hours, but as you get into, say, the second day after infusion, this is showing up on every other day infusion schedule, um, you can see that um, towards that second day, patients are spending a considerable amount of time with uh, residual factor levels that are below a critical threshold where they're at risk for, for uh, more bleeding. Even the extended half-life products really haven't eliminated this. They, they do change the pharmacokinetic profile, allowing for spacing out dosing, but patients can still spend a considerable amount of time with levels that are in a range that would be putting them at risk for breakthrough bleeding. Here's, here's a, a study that I'm going to use to anchor some of our discussion as we get into gene therapy. So um, this is showing uh, that uh, the annual number of joint bleeds is highest in those individuals who have the lowest factor levels. So factor levels depicted across the bottom. So when we're talking about severe hemophilia, this is less than 1% levels, and you can see that they have the highest uh, risk of bleeding. But even having a small percentage of residual factor, as we see in so-called moderate hemophilia, has a significant impact on uh, reducing the risk for bleeding. Um, if you get up into the mild range, above 5%, um, joint bleeding becomes quite unusual and there's probably a percentage of residual activity we don't know exactly what that is whether it's 12 percent or 15 percent or higher where uh, joint bleeds basically um, just are, are not seen in those individuals well what have we been doing with traditional prophylaxis in general uh, we're correcting the levels uh, for a good amount of the uh, of the week but um, those trough levels are going to fall below critical levels of somewhere between 1% to 3% in almost all the individuals who are on, on prophylaxis. If you do some pharmacokinetic analysis and optimize the therapy, you can probably get patients who maintain trough levels that are closer to 3 to 
But if we really want to uh, push the envelope, we probably have to use things like the extended half-life molecules or maybe some of the newer non-factor replacement therapies to get out into a range uh, where uh, we are really uh, maintaining levels that are probably going to make joint bleeding be very, very unusual. And if, if we want to call it aspirational prophylaxis, if we want to eliminate all risk of joint bleeding, we probably need to get into levels that are persistent consistently in 15%, 20% or higher on a regular basis. So what this graph is showing is that with traditional prophylaxis, we have a factor level we can measure in the plasma after infusion and then as it goes back down to its trough. And that has a predicted um, hemostatic effect, so a, a control of bleed that's associated with it. The extended half-life factors um, modify the pharmacokinetics, and in some cases, what we can do is we can maintain the trough levels a little bit higher, as I was suggesting, and this could have some impact on, uh, on patients. If we want to um, uh, uh, take things to a, a different level, this is where the non-factor therapies or the non-factor replacement therapies come into place. Now, the only one that's been approved to date is emicizumab. This is a bispecific antibody that mimics what uh, uh, factor eight can do in blood clotting. But in this case, we don't have any measurable factor level because this, this is not a factor product. It's not factor eight. So there's nothing to measure that gives you an idea of where the patient is on, on their, um, uh, you know, related to a factor level. But there is a predictable hemostatic effect from these factors. And because of their very long half-life, it's what we call a steady state hemostasis. So basically every hour of the day, they're maintained at a level um, that uh, hopefully is at a level that is protective from joint bleeding. Um, as I mentioned, the only one that's approved so far is this um, memetic um, or this bispecific antibody, but we have a number of agents that are under uh, development right now that I would call hemostatic rebalancing agents. These target a number of different uh, natural anticoagulants in the blood, and they're trying to restore the balance between the, the missing procoagulants and trying to hinder the natural anticoagulants to rebalance the hemostatic system. And we don't have time to go through each of these today, but all of these technologies are being examined in clinical trials, and we're developing some good experience, and they, they seem to have promise. What are some of the trends we're seeing with modern hemophilia therapeutics? So we talked about this shift from so-called minimally effective prophylaxis to optimized prophylaxis, more emphasis on higher trough levels, either through more intensive prophylaxis or using extended half-life factors. But bioengineered molecules are helping us get there. Um, some of the non-factor therapies are shifting to steady state prophylaxis, where we have this even keel level of hemostatic protection rather than the peaks and troughs of traditional factor replacement therapy. And one other added benefit of some of these agents is their subcutaneous delivery um, over the intravenous of traditional factor. This has been a major boon for our youngest patients, like infants, where prophylaxis has been almost impossible. Um, but really, for a a lot of patients with challenging venous access, this has completely transformed how they take care of their hemophilia. The other thing is, is when you're not wedded to replacing the missing factor, like factor eight or factor nine, we're now seeing that these uh, targets um, that are rebalancing the hemostatic system can be used very broadly. So they, they're effective whether you have an inhibitor or not. Um, this was also true for emicizumab, where it's equally effective in non-inhibitors as it is in inhibitor patients. And now you have some of these cross-segment therapies that can be used for hemophilia A, hemophilia B, with and without inhibitors. And so I, I think these are going to continue to have major impacts on our, on our practice. What does gene therapy have to offer? Well, um, many of us um, who look after hemophilia, we begrudge the fact that we can't measure something in plasma. And the idea with gene therapy is by giving a good copy of the gene, they're going to make uh, a factor eight or factor nine that is measurable in the plasma because it's a steady state manufacturing of the factor eight or factor nine, you are going to get a steady state level in that plasma. And that's going to have a predictable effect on hemostasis for the individual. And then the big plus with gene therapy is this is a single treatment 
you get a, a, a prolonged impact, a prolonged expression from that uh, construct, and hopefully that's all you ever have to do to manage your hemophilia. So now let's get into gene therapy. What are we really doing here? So the whole idea here is um, we need to take a good copy of the gene, so either factor eight or factor nine, and get it into an organ that is capable of um, manufacturing uh, uh, and, and synthesizing and expressing either that factor eight or factor nine. Turns out the liver um, is a great organ for a number of reasons. It's used to making proteins in large amounts. It's, it's really what it does. It makes a lot of clotting factors already, including factor nine. And uh, we have vehicles that we can specifically target the liver. So what's the trick with gene therapy? Well, we don't um, need to use a, a virus because we're not looking to propagate anything. Normally viruses get into your tissues and they take over the engineering of your cells and they just make more viruses. That's all they do. We just want to use the coat of the virus and what we call these vectors and we strip out the viral genes and that gives us space to put in the gene of interest and I, I've used this analogy of uh, an Amazon delivery so in this case what, what did you really order from Amazon well you ordered a good copy of factor 8 or factor 9 and now you've got to get it delivered to your house or to your liver in this case so the vehicle for the delivery um, the package um, is the the viral vector and uh, these are these vectors are, are we're using a platform called, called adeno associated virus or AAV so that's the technology emptied of their viral genes replaced just with the components of the factor 8 or factor 9 and a few elements to ensure that it gets expressed it's delivered intravenously um, because of the characteristics of these AAV vectors they home to the liver so just like you have a delivery address on your Amazon package um, these vectors go directly to the liver um, they get taken up by the by the receptors on the liver the AAV goes into the cell and then it heads straight to the nucleus where the uh, it um, uh, meets up with the lining of, of the nucleus the gene is inserted into the nucleus of the cell and uh, that gene is then available to the machinery of the cell to start making the factor 8 or factor 9 protein and then the liver cell secretes that into the plasma um, the uh, cell then um, just like you do with all your Amazon boxes at Christmas as they accumulate in your front hallway your cell breaks down those boxes um, breaks them up into little pieces and then um, uh, displays them on the surface of the cell where they're eventually uh, all all um, degraded and cleared now one of the, we're going to come back to this a little bit later, but the challenges of gene therapy is your immune system can recognize these packages at two important junctures. One is you could have antibodies that are already primed and ready to recognize these types of AAV vectors. And if that's the case, if those, vector, if those antibodies are too high, they would basically coat the vectors and they would block their ability to make it to the liver and transduce the liver. And so it, the therapy wouldn't work. So that's the first hurdle. And then the second hurdle is, when you start to break down the proteins here and you present them on the cell to get cleared, the immune system is very smart and they can in some circumstances identify the specific cells that are trying to um, basically recycle these AV vector proteins. And accordingly, the immune system may actually mount an immune response against those cells and actually eliminate that cell from the liver. And so that's a, a form of liver toxicity that we have seen in the clinical trials. And we can talk about some ways to, to modulate that. So you may wonder uh, that you've been hearing about gene therapy for a long time, and that's true. Um, uh, for a couple of decades before the 2000s, they were in preclinical development, and the first wave of clinical trials occurred from the late 1990s to the, to the mid-2000s. We had some successes with the, uh, the safety and the delivery of these therapies, but we were really challenged by the immune response. 
And so we had to go back to the drawing board a little bit. And so there were some more preclinical studies that brought a new uh, strategy to the clinic. And the proof of concept um, a trial, the landmark one, was uh, conducted from 2010 to 2014, a joint venture between uh, St. Jude um, uh, here in Memphis and the University of College uh, of London in the UK. And they treated uh, 10 men with severe hemophilia B with an AAV vector, and they have now been able to achieve long-lasting expression of factor IX in those men. And actually, as you can see, the anniversary for the early men who participate in this trial is approaching 10 years. And I think it's, it's this month coming up. So these men have received gene therapy. They've had sufficient expression so that they haven't needed to remain on prophylaxis. Um, they're not having breakthrough bleeding and it's been 10 years and they're still expressing. And so with that proof of concept trial, there's been an explosion uh, that has led to all of the current wave of clinical trials. And I'm gonna share a few things to give you a picture of, of what's been going on. Now, one thing is, Who's been actually getting gene therapy? So these inclusion and exclusion criteria have been pretty standard across all of the clinical trials to date. So we've only been doing gene therapy in men who are at least age 18 or older. They all have had severe hemophilia, so less than 1% factor eight. Um, for factor nine, we've allowed up to less than 2%. They have to have had a lots of prior exposures to factor VIII um, with no signs of having ever had an inhibitor. And um, most of the trials, these men have either come into the trials on prophylaxis or, or have been on uh, demand therapy for some time. Um, Except for some uh, very unique circumstances, all of these trials are screening the patients to see if they have those pre-existing antibodies that have the capability of, of, of binding and if you like neutralizing the AAV vectors. Um, and if, if they have too high of a titer, those men have been excluded from the trial. Because we target the liver, we want a good functioning liver. You don't have to have um, uh, be you have, many of our patients have had uh, exposure to hepatitis C and, and, and HIV, uh, but they need to have been on good treatment and they need to have gone through the antiviral treatment to eradicate the hepatitis C, and then they need to show that their liver function is good. Um, so that's the population of patients that essentially all, all the trials have, have included to this point. So I want to show you some examples of what we can expect to see with gene therapy. This is a, a, a study um, from a company called Unicure. This was uh, uh, using an AAV uh, capsid. Um, it was a AAV5, which is the subtype of the uh, capsid that was used. And uh, this was uh, a study conducted in men with severe hemophilia B and delivering a native form of the factor IX gene. And they did this in two dose cohorts, a lower dose cohort, we'll call cohort one, and a higher dose cohort, cohort two. And uh, both, both cohorts of men, the five individuals each, were able to achieve expression levels um, that were meaningful. And in the highest dose cohort, what you can see is there was a range of expression that has now been uh, out to uh, uh, two and a half to three years or more, um, where they're maintaining steady state levels of between four to almost 11 percent. Well, what's the impact of expressing a steady state level of factor nine um, in that context? Well, here's the, the lower dose cohort that didn't have even that level of expression. In the red bars, this was their pretreatment um, annualized factor usage, and this was their mean annualized number of bleeds per year. And then you can see with each subsequent year, their bleeding has improved and they've been using less and less uh, factor. A lot of the men that were part of this cohort were actually uh, considerably older and had uh, quite diseased joints coming into the trial. But if we look at cohort two, this was a younger population of patients, not 
quite as much uh, joint disease. Uh, accordingly, they came in with a little bit less uh, factor usage, uh, less uh, likelihood of having uh, annualized bleeds. But they've done exceedingly well. These men have been able to re be remain off prophylaxis. And you can see here in year four, no bleeding events and uh, uh, little to no use of uh, factor products. Well, a real innovation that's come for patients with uh, hemophilia B was the recognition that a single modification of the uh, amino acid sequence of the factor IX can have a dramatic effect on its activity. Um, this was actually discovered in a family in Padua, Italy, who had sky-high levels of factor IX. Normally, your factor IX level would never be above 100%. And the patients in this uh, family cohort had levels between 700 and 900%, so sev up to seven-fold or more higher uh, activity of factor IX. They actually presented with uh, clotting problems. That's how they were discovered. Well, you can introduce this um, single uh, mutation um, and uh, uh, modify the, the transgene that goes into the, um, the vector. And you can now have that vector deliver not just a good copy of factor IX, but a hyperactive copy of that factor IX. So now, with the same vector system that I just showed you in the previous trial, um, uh, we can see what would happen if we could boost the activity by, say, six to seven fold. And so uh, this was part of a study we did here at the University of Michigan, as well as some colleagues uh, um, uh, around, the, around the country. And uh, in the three individuals where we, we trialed this, they were now able to achieve steady state factor IX levels that were between 30 to even 50%. And most people would consider the non-hemophilia range anything above 40%. So you can see that two of these men essentially have had their hemostatic system normalized by this vector. Um, these gentlemen have been able to uh, stay off uh, uh, factor IX prophylaxis. They're maintaining a factor IX activity uh, of about 41% overall. No bleeds, no need for factor IX replacement therapy routinely. They've had no loss of their factor IX activity over time. And at least in, in this portion of, of the trial, none of them required any immune suppression intervention for the immune reaction I mentioned to you a little while ago. So this has now gone on to a, a, what we call a phase three study, which is a much larger trial. It's going to enroll about 55 patients. It's fully enrolled. Almost all the participants have been dosed. And um, we should be able to hear the results from this sometime later this year or early next year. Um, notably in this trial, they were able to uh, study patients who had certain levels of pre-existing antibodies and uh, they made the decision that they could continue to dose those patients even in the presence of, of neutralizing antibodies. So it would be exciting to see how that plays out with the larger proportion of patients. Um, I wanted to give, use this study. This was presented at the uh, big international meeting in Melbourne, Australia uh, this past summer. This is from uh, a trial from Spark Therapeutics, again, using a hyperactive Padua variant for uh, severe hemophilia B. Um, these men had similar results to what I showed you, getting levels that were um, uh, approaching or within the normal range. They've been able to come off prophylaxis. They, they're not having bleeding and essentially not having to need exogenous factor concentrates. But I wanted to show you the clinically meaningful quality of life improvements that these men are reporting. Now, these are a couple of tools. These are survey instruments that are given to the patients. And this one on the left, the EQVAS, what we're looking for here is a higher value implies an improvement in their overall health-related quality of life. And you can see that there were, it was significantly affected after their treatment. And then uh, a hemophilia-specific um, uh, a survey called the Hemoqual was also administered. And now in this case, um, we want to see lower va values as, a, as an indication of an uh, of an of improvement because this is a measure of impairment across these different domains. And what you can see that post vector is almost all of these domains that the individuals are reporting significant impacts on this uh, quality of life measure. Well, the million dollar question is, well, will this expression be lifelong in patients after gene therapy? 
Well, we've been studying gene therapy for several decades, as I mentioned. Um, uh, we can cure mice, um, and those mice have sustained expression lifelong. You may know that there's a couple of different dog colonies that are available. Um, one has hemophilia A and another one has hemophilia B, so that's great. And they've been studied over many years using these same AAV vectors we've been talking about today. And you can see that um, these um, dogs have had sustained expression for over uh, 12 years. In fact, uh, most of these dogs have lived ripe old ages and had to be put down just because they were too old. Um, a lot of these studies also study in uh, non-human primates, so-called macaques, and we have some uh, longevity follow-up there of about six years. And if we look at all the gene therapies that have been conducted to date, we have uh, individuals who are showing sustained expression of factor IX for at least 10 years, and, uh, and it, whether it's targeting the muscles or um, in the recent uh, iteration that I that I just told you about uh, from the University of College of London in St. Jude, um, between eight to 10 years targeting the liver. So I think these are showing us that with this platform, we are able to get sustained expression over long periods of time. I don't think we can say anything about over a lifetime at this point, of course, but I think the aspiration is hopefully that we will be able to see that. Um, here's a study from um, uh, Biomarin. This was just uh, published, actually, um, uh, from final data just uh, about a month ago. Um, but this was data that they presented also uh, this past summer. And this is showing the factor activity levels now over uh, a three-year period. Now, in this study was um, a phase uh, one, two study. So it was an early phase study. They were still looking at two different doses. But I want you to focus on the higher dose cohort here on the left panel. And the numbers over here, remember the non-hemophilic range here is anything over 40%. And so what you can see here is that patients, sure there's, there's a wide range of, of expression, but the majority of patients are well above uh, uh, that threshold. And they've been able to sustain that out through uh, three years of follow-up. What's been the impact on their uh, bleed rates and on their factor utilization? So this is looking at their annualized bleed rate. This was their bleed rates before they came into the trial. Um, and you can see that bleeds basically evaporated completely uh, after dosing with the vector. And that's been sustained over uh, three years. And that was actually seen in both of the cohorts that they were studying in that trial. And then if we look at their annualized factor eight usage, if you're not bleeding and you don't need prophylaxis, you're probably not using much factor. And that's exactly what's been seen. 96% reduction in factor usage, 97% uh, reduction in factor eight usage. And you can see that that's been sustained out through three years of follow-up uh, with, with, with these uh, cohorts. This study has now um, also uh, shown some uh, quality of life uh, impacts. And again, using this, uh, uh, this is a different measure, this heme qual A uh, tool. Here we're looking at the uh, total scores. And uh, uh, in this case, this is a difference from their uh, baseline. And uh, across all of the domains sustained over the, the subsequent years after dosing, you can see that we're seeing quality of life improvement across all of these important domains um, that are listed here. This has gone on to a phase three study. It's uh, fully enrolled. Um, uh, the patients have um, uh, essentially uh, all been dosed and um, we're waiting for the evaluation by the regulators because the uh, company has announced that they have submitted their license application to the FDA and the European uh, Licensing Authority. The regulatory authorities. Um, this was early cut of the data from the phase three trial showing similar results of sustained expression over the, the follow-up uh, of the study. And this was um, a very early cut, so it's uh, just, just about uh, six months of follow-up. But it looks like we're seeing the similar data where their annualized bleeding rate has been substantially impacted by the therapy and a 95% reduction in their uh, factor eight usage. So I think we're all uh, with waiting anxiously to see the final data from this study and whether this is uh, hopefully going to be approved uh, maybe even later this year. <laughs> 
Um, lots of other work is still going. Um, I, I can't show you all the data from all the companies, but th this is one that I was uh, impressed with also from this uh, past summer's meeting. And uh, this was a, a study um, uh, from uh, Sangamo Therapeutics um, using an AAV6 uh, uh, const uh, capsid uh, for factor eight for se severe hemophilia A. And they were still doing dose finding in this study. And so you can see the, the uh, cascading increase of doses that were delivered to the patients. But I want you to high, I want to highlight the highest dose subjects here. So these would be subjects um, uh, really seven through uh, 10 that are depicted here. And you can see uh, that now we're getting levels that are well in, into the normal range here between 50 to even 170%. So if you remember going back to that so-called aspirational prophylaxis we talked about at the very beginning, you can see that the reality of gene therapy is, is we're able to push patients that are uh, well into that range and maybe even sustaining them in levels that really are, are no different than unaffected individuals. Now, let's, get, let's talk a little bit about some of the, the remaining challenges. So we mentioned these neutralizing antibodies. Well, how common is it to have antibodies that would exclude you from these trials? Well, unfortunately, it actually is quite common. And uh, I would say the number one disappointment I've had in enrolling patients on these trials is when we do the screening studies and then we find out that they had to be excluded because their antibodies were too, were too high. And this is looking at a number of different studies, a number of different uh, AAV capsid types, and it doesn't seem to matter which AAV capsid is chosen. There's a little bit of uh, variation by geographies and between the different capsid. But overall, I think we have to expect that somewhere between 20 to 40 percent of individuals who want to participate in gene therapy are likely going to be excluded because of the pre-existing antibodies. What could we do then? Is that, does that mean they could never get gene therapy? Well, uh, you, you can do a few things. I've had examples where there's enough new technologies with new capsids being developed and so and some even bioengineered capsids, that they're opening up opportunities where you, if you screened out of one trial, let's say you were screened for an AAV cap, AVA capsid, um, it's possible you might not be positive and affecting some of these other types of capsids and you might be able to get that therapy. So switching to an alternative serotype is, is definitely an example. And I have had some clinical trial participants who screened out of one trial, we rescreened them for another and they were eligible. Um, could you dose earlier before the seroprevalence is high? Well, the question is, is how early? We think people start to develop these antibodies as actually young children. And of course, we're not doing these studies in children. So I don't think moving the age group, uh, unless we went very, very early in life, we're not likely to avoid the seroprevalence that's uh, challenging these studies. There's a technique called plasmapheresis where you can hook up uh, patients to a, um, a device that um, basically cleans their blood, if you like, and it pulls those antibodies off. That's relatively efficient. And it could be that just by reducing those levels low enough, that would give you a window where you could do the dosing with the therapy and still get efficient transduction. Some people have also proposed maybe using different forms of immunosuppression to dampen down the antibodies or wipe them out completely. Some people have thought about delivering the vector directly into the liver itself. And there's also the possibility as well, can we use alternative capsids, um, either use a higher dose or decoys or things like that that might be able to um, uh, help us. Um, one of the newest technologies that I think uh, we've seen at some recent meetings are the use of non-viral delivery vehicles. So still using the same concept of the Amazon package, but instead of using a virus that is like this, that may have antibodies directed against it, you're using these um, non-viral uh, therapies, things like um, lip, lipid um, uh, lipid uh, or liposomes that form an envelope around the vector. Um, this may uh, be able to circumvent this problem of pre-existing immunity. Another question that people have asked me is, what do we know about 
what happens to the DNA when it gets in the cell. Now, one of the things you're going to hear about the AV platform is that it's a non-integrating uh, virus. Well, that's, that's to counter what we talked about at the very beginning. Some of the vectors um, like gamma retroviruses, et cetera, and those are, those are uh, types of viral vectors that mechanism of action is to integrate into the DNA. AAV platform works without integrating into the DNA of the host. Um, the, the DNA actually that's delivered by the vector generally stays as a circular form of DNA inside the nucleus, but it doesn't incorporate into the cells. If the cell divided, um, only the chromosomes would divide and the, uh, the um, uh, AAV trans, the, the leftover transgene would not be delivered to the daughter cells. But it's not exclusively non-integrating. We know that integrating events happen. So um, they're probably rare, relatively rare events, but we're giving quadrillions of these particles to patients when they undergo gene therapy. So if even a very small percentage of cells has these integration events, that's still probably a significant number in the liver. Well, have we seen any consequences? Um, the very first wave of patients are just having liver biopsies conducted, and uh, we're going to learn some information from that. Uh, MASAC has actually encouraged the companies to pursue this type of investigation so we can learn what's happening in human gene therapy. But what have we learned from the dogs? This was a really important study that I saw presented this past summer. So again, this is back to the dog colony. This was a, a hemophilia A dog colony who all got AAV factor gene therapy 12 years ago those dogs lived to a ripe old age and then they were they were put down because they were too old they maintained expression of their factor 8 all the way through their lifespan um, it, when they did the postmortem on the uh, livers, the, these dogs still had evidence that the DNA was in the cells, so it was long-term persistence of the DNA. They all had improvement in their bleeding expression um, throughout their lifespan, and you can see that uh, these dogs were maintaining between 5 to 10% levels, depending on what, what assay we used. Um, there was no particular predictors identified for who would be, you know, have good expression or not. Um, but some of the things they observed uh, from these dogs, some of the dogs showed elevation in their liver enzymes with time, but this is actually observed in elderly dogs anyways. They undergo, their livers undergo as they age something called nodular hyperplasia and vacular hepatopathy. These are uh, uh, observations from the, the tissue sectioning of the livers. This has been seen as a normal age-related change in dogs and was not attributable to having gone through a gene therapy. And most importantly, there was no no evidence of any liver tumors that had developed. And then uh, just this uh, recent ASH meeting, uh, the he big hematology meeting uh, in December, uh, we had um, a, a group from um, University of Pennsylvania show their uh, postmortems on dogs with hemophilia B who had gone through gene therapy. They did uh, show a number of integration events into the chromosomes of the cells of the liver. Um, and they did show that those cells, when, because it integrates, uh, those cells, when they divide, it does get passed on to the daughter cells. So we call that clonal expansion. But despite those observations, there was no evidence of any uh, tumor genesis uh, in the dog. So I, I, I think that it's very important that we do, that we do these, this work. Um, I think it's going to be equally important to see the results from the um, uh, liver biopsies that will come through from the patients who um, undergo that. Um, uh, and we're still going to be learning about this over time, but uh, based on the safety and the efficacy that we've observed from this platform to date, um, I have every confidence that we're going to see um, uh, for sure uh, a, a number of these therapies are going to likely um, go through regulatory review and uh, hopefully be approved and coming to a clinic near you. So just to summarize what we talked about tonight. We have gone through a transition here. Um, the so-called um, substitution therapies like emicizumab and the hemostatic rebalancing therapies 
These are really um, disruptors in the, uh, the clinical treatment space. They're sub-Q delivery. They have a low burden of frequency administration. They do give steady state hemostasis. We can use these in pediatrics and adults. We can use them in inhibitors and non-inhibitors, but they're likely not achieving normal levels. Um, they might be curative from the standpoint that many patients aren't having joint bleedings anymore, but they're probably not at levels that can get them through um, surgeries or through major trauma. Some of these have shown that they do carry some thrombotic risk. Um, I mentioned that we have all kinds of assay challenges with these agents. Um, and all of these therapies are only good for prophylaxis. They don't treat a breakthrough bleeding event. So patients still have to rely on factor or bypassing agents um, to treat breakthrough bleeding events. And of course, these agents have an annual expense. Um, uh, some of these are, are, are really in the same annual expense as normal factor eight replacement. Well, what about gene therapy? Well, there is the possibility that this is a true one and done therapy. Um, what gene therapy looks like in my, in my uh, investigational clinic is the patient, if they're all um, uh, queued up and ready to go, they come in in the morning, um, we get them prepped. Um, the uh, infusion goes in uh, from an IV bag uh, hooked up uh, through uh, IV access into their arm. It goes in over about 40 minutes to an hour. Um, we watch them for a few hours and then they go home. And that's literally the totality of their treatment. Now, I say one and done, but it's not set it and forget it. And what I mean by that is you don't, you don't just get this therapy and then you know, go, go off on your business. We do need to follow you uh, quite intently to make sure that you have the best outcome from this therapy. But this does achieve steady state hemostasis. I've seen this in the patients who participate in these trials. The levels are definitely in the curative range for most individuals. And in some cases, they're in the normal range. And this is the first therapy that maybe has the opportunity to introduce annual cost savings because you're not going to have to do annual uh, factor eight replacement. We do have eligibility challenges. We're not doing this in pediatrics yet. And importantly, this has not been offered to anybody, not just with an active inhibitor, but even a history of an inhibitor has been excluded from all of the trials to date. Pre-existing immunity, um, we, we know, is a challenge. Um, there's no question there are known and unknown risks, but this, pro this platform has been studied over multiple decades, multiple animal uh, subtypes, long-term therapy uh, observations in humans. Um, we, we recognize that there are known and unknown risks, but we're, we're following these patients to try to evaluate that. We have to say, at least for now, the durability is uncertain. I'm pretty confident that we've seen data to support that this is at least 10 years and perhaps it's going to be longer. Um, will you be able to redose? Um, not with the current technology, but I actually, I think very soon we're going to see some protocols devised so the patients did lose their expression or they were excluded because of pre existing immunity, uh, uh, dosing uh, will be available to them in a, in a different sort of investigational study. Um, not, not sure coding it. I'm sure these will be some of the most expensive therapies that have come to hemophilia ever. Um, we're probably talking in the millions of dollars. However, considering some patients are uh, having annual costs of therapy of four to five hundred thousand dollars a year, um, you know, for some of these therapies, even having expression over five or eight years will uh, entirely pay for itself. And then every year of expression after that is going to be uh, an additional bonus. So um, I hope I've uh, you know, given you a good perspective about what's going on in gene therapy. I think you should be aware that I, I really feel that we are just a few months away uh, from maybe having the first approved therapy in this regard. And I'm um, happy to, uh, to take some questions. Thank you, Dr. Um, Fight. I appreciate it. And we do have, we do have the, um, <clears throat> uh, just another polling question real quickly. Let me get this over here. Yeah, it doesn't want to. Um, just another polling question real quickly. Um, we're going to switch it up a bit. Some of you may not have been on when we did the first polling question, but you should be able to see it just now. Do you have a better understanding of, oh, here, let me launch this. 
Do you have a better understanding of gene therapy after participating in this webinar? And then secondly, in thinking about gene therapy as a potential treatment option, what is most important to you? We're gonna give you just a minute to um, answer that. And while you are, I will start asking Dr. Pipe some of the questions that we had. Um, and I apologize if you may have answered some of these because I was trying to um, take notes as well as listen to you. So uh, the first question I saw was, I'm concerned due to the steroid use during gene therapy, should I be? Also, if I'm already on a low dose prednisone, will steroids still be needed? Yeah, so I only um, talked very cursorily about the immunosuppression. So this goes back to that second opportunity that your immune system has to react to the AV vector when you're trying to um, clear the, the viral caps that are the recycle it, so to speak. Um, the way we identify this is we watch the patients very closely and if their liver enzymes start to increase, this is a sign of potential liver toxicity. This is generally asymptomatic. This would not, these patients don't have any symptoms. It would not be picked up unless we were using the sensitive laboratory assays. But the first uh, instance we see this, uh, what, the, what the intervention has, has involved is um, putting patients on a relatively short course of what are called corticosteroids, prednisone. Prednisone is used as an immunosuppression in a number of different uh, conditions, asthma, um, other different inflammatory disorders, etc. Um, it's generally tolerated pretty well. Um, I wouldn't say it's completely symptom-free, um, but it's 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 a cascading dose, which means you start at a high dose and then, if as long as the patient's res responding, we drop the dose, you know, every week or so. Most patients are on for a course of uh, several weeks and then it's discontinued. Um, it has not been a, um, uh, a deterrent for patients to participate in the trials to my experience and uh, everyone who's had to go through the short course of immunosuppression has done, uh, done well with it. Um, I, I, I would like to avoid it if we can. I think anybody who didn't have to go on steroids would be happier not to. But since this is a, a one-time therapy, and you really want to assure the best outcome. It seems that um, treating this uh, with, with the immunosuppression is been important in order to ensure that patients maintain good expression. Okay. Um, next is, how am I to know if my son with hemophilia A has a microbleed or a bleed in general if he is not experiencing pain or an injury. As far as I know, he's not had a joint bleed. However, he bruises easily. Bumps on his head have taken a long time to heal with factor. And now he's on a non-factor replacement um, treatment. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I think what we have to do is recognize is that what, what we're talking about is we're using this information about microbleeds to identify um, how we should be approaching therapy. Um, we don't go searching for microbleeds. We don't do MRIs in all of our patients. We don't measure hemosiderin levels. We, we take the data from these studies and they highlight to us that there's room for improvement in how the overall process of how we treat patients. So there's no question. Um, prophylaxis is the uh, standard over on demand. So you should not assume that just because, you know, you don't have that many bleeds uh, on demand, that this is uh, going to maintain joint health. We know from a lot of different circles of evidence that just because you aren't feeling that you're having uh, repeated bleeds, if you're not on prophylaxis, your joint outcome is definitely going to be worse. But even for the individuals who are prophylaxis, we've seen the impact of uh, whether you're on minimally effective prophylaxis or whether um, uh, you are on a higher, uh, more intensive prophylaxis. Does every patient need that? Not necessarily. Um, uh, we wish we had better tools to identify those patients who need more aggressive prophylaxis than others. 
But I think what it's telling us as a, as a platform is aspirationally, we want to get patients well away from the hemophilic bleeding range. And uh, the non-factor therapies maybe are taking us incrementally in that, in that direction. And that has certainly been true in my experience with a lot of patients. But I think gene therapy, I think really gives us an option to get a large number of patients well up into uh, close to, if not the normal range, and hopefully eliminate this risk for bleeding altogether. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a couple questions on inhibitors here. Uh, I'm going to maybe combine a couple of these. First is, can you clarify if someone has had a history of an inhibitor but is tolerized, are they excluded from gene therapy? And then another person asks, is there a danger of causing an inhibitor by using this method? And I'm not sure what they meant by this method. I'm wondering well, I, if they meant by... Yeah, no, I, I can speak to that. So... Um, uh, there was always a concern that because these patients had severe hemophilia and they're now going to be making a good copy of, uh, of the protein, that their immune system could react to that and actually, you know, trigger an inhibitor. And of course, these are patients who have been used to using factor eight replacement all their life. And then if they now develop an inhibitor triggered by um, AV gene therapy, that would be unfortunate. That has not been seen. Um, all the patients who participated, nobody has developed an inhibitor, even though we, we check rigorously for that. So that's encouraging. And actually, there's, there's preclinical studies in animals that would actually suggest the opposite, that when your body makes its own version of factor eight or factor nine, for instance, in the liver, that this actually has a tolerizing effect and um, uh, would be not only unlikely to make an inhibitor, but if you had an inhibitor, it might actually facilitate tolerization. Now, nobody uh, was prepared to test that in the first wave of clinical trials. And so all those patients, even with a history of inhibitor, were excluded from the trial. So unfortunately, the first scenario that was presented was, what if you had a remote inhibitor, you got treated, you were tolerized, and you're using factor eight, you've been on factor eight for years. Unfortunately, yes, all of those patients have been excluded from the clinical trial. If... <laughs> If that is a requirement for, for uh, an approved product, um, then that exclusion criteria will remain. But I believe very soon you're going to see some expansion of cohorts to allow inclusion of patients who have a remote history of inhibitors. And it may be even in the post-marketing set, setting after approval that there will be some um, studies on patients who have remote inhibitors who are still offered gene therapy. So hopefully we'll get the answer to that question uh, very soon. Well, and this is um, maybe similar, but the question um, is, would messing with genes make factor less effective? Trying to think of risks. And so I'm wondering if the question, what they're asking is, if you've had gene therapy, is the factor that is produced as effective as the a normal person, or somebody who doesn't have hem hemophilia, yeah. Yeah, this, this is... factor, or the exogenous factor mm -hmm. that you're giving through factor replacement? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, first of all, you should know that um, the factor eight that's being used, because of the constraints of the size of the AAV viral vector, only a truncated form of factor eight fits into the uh, the, the truncated form of the factor eight gene fits into the vector. So all of these uh, factor eight gene therapy programs are using what's called a B-domain deleted form. Now, we've been using B-domain deleted factor eight in a number of uh, approved iterations all over the world for years and years. And uh, those patients intermittently get exposed to full length factor eight and other fa factor eight variants. There doesn't appear to be any link with uh, uh, a reduced efficiency of, of how it functions in, in blood clotting, uh, risk for inhibitors, et cetera. So I, I think in good confidence, we've used these B-domain deleted transgenes and they've done very well. And when patients have needed factor for like a major surgery or if they did have a breakthrough bleed, there's no sign that it interferes with the infused factor. And so they're still able to treat accordingly. For factor nine, um, we are 
almost essentially all of the current iterations of uh, heme B trials are using that hyperactive Padua variant. That is a superactive form of factor IX. Uh, we don't have a recombinant version of that, so we don't have anything to compare to. But when patients have needed to use um, regular factor IX, they seem to get uh, the normal response to that infused factor. Um, is there a risk of too much clotting uh, if the levels got really high. Um, we haven't seen that with the factor nine trials, including with Padua. Um, for factor eight, we did get some patients who got very high levels, two, 300% even, but none of them had any consequence from that. Nobody developed any clot complications from the elevated factor eight. So, so, so far that has not um, proven to be a challenge. Okay, I wanna go back to something you said. You said truncated. Um, and that might be a, a little bit diff difficult concept for some people to understand. Could you explain that a little bit further? Yeah, so we've known for a number of years that there's a large central portion of the, of the factor eight molecule that can be removed and it still functions like it's supposed to as a factor eight molecule. In fact, this central portion gets cut out when it gets activated with normal uh, blood clotting. So uh, this has been known now for about 40 years um, that this segment of the factor eight can be removed and you can still have a functional protein. So that's what I mean by, by truncated. Okay, thank you. Um, a question came in, could gene therapy be used in female carriers or females with bleeding disorders? And what about women who have hemophilia? Yeah, um, I am sad to say that um, all women have been excluded from AV gene therapy to date for hemophilia. Um, there is some concerns about how we would monitor for any impact on the um, the, the sex cells, okay? So obviously, um, you know, we do check the, um, the sperm of the individuals who participate in these trials, and we follow them to make sure that the, all the viral and the DNA elements clear from the, the sperm completely. And actually, all of the men are required to use barrier protection for uh, many months until the testing has shown that the, all the, the, the vector capsid and DNA elements have cleared. Um, we don't have the same capability uh, with uh, women because we can't check their, uh, their ova, we can't check the, the ovaries in the same way. So until there's a, a better technique or some other ways to prove that the AV platform uh, poses no risk in that regard, unfortunately this particular platform of gene therapy is not going to be offered to women. That's too bad. Um, next, if potentially 40% will not qualify for gene therapy due to antibodies being present, is industry still looking to improve the current extended half-life products or other types of therapies? Uh, absolutely. In fact, um, uh, we're excited to be participating in a, in a super long acting uh, factor eight um, a product that is just just along those lines. Um, uh, this would be about um, four to five times longer half-life than uh, the standard uh, factor eight. And there are other companies who are working on, um, you know, maybe some other variants uh, along the same line. So we're seeing innovation from a number of, a number of different uh, channels. And so, you know, gene therapy is not, um, you know, sort of the funnel from which all patients are eventually um, gonna have their therapy um, uh, funneled into. Um, gene therapy is just gonna be an option. Um, and we're very excited about about all these other uh, new lines of investigation that are opening up possibilities for patients as well. Perfect. Um, so next are some questions about the process of um, the infusion. And I had some questions about, are there any types of medications given prior to the actual gene therapy infusion, such as chemotherapeutic drugs or immunotherapeutics? And would immunosuppression from the start of therapy improve outcomes or decrease that risk yeah. associated with the Great, great question. Um, with the, the current phase three studies, 
Um, the majority of them are using still a, what I would call a reactive approach to immunosuppression. So they're not placed on anything at the time of infusion. Um, most of the immune reaction seems to occur maybe around week four, maybe through week 12. So uh, we really watch closely in that window. And then if the liver enzymes go up, we, uh, if it reaches a certain threshold, we start the corticosteroids. But there are some um, studies in the past that have done prophylactic prednisone. And there's at least um, one uh, uh, protocol for hemophilia B that's, a, that's um, a moving towards phase three, where they actually do a prophylactic strategy where they use two different immunosuppressant drugs, trying to eliminate um, any chance of the immune reaction. So uh, I, I think we are going to see those types of protocols and, uh, you know, what, what becomes sort of the, the standard across all the therapies, I think remains to be seen, but um, it's, it's a great thought. And yes, people are, have, are thinking about and incorporating prophylactic strategies. Okay. Um, there's uh, a couple of questions on insurance. So where do insurance providers stand on this? And then um, in that same vein, not necessarily, I shouldn't say in the same vein, um, along with that, will this be available at every HTC or will there, will there only be certain HTCs where it's available at? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, you have to imagine at what's at stake here for the companies that make these therapies. They are having all kinds of... Uh, uh, hopefully productive interactions with the uh, the payers and specialty pharmacies, et cetera, towards um, ensuring that the, those barriers for reimbursement are, are you know, removed if possible. Um, uh, we've have had multiple gene therapies approved over the last uh, couple of years. I, I showed you some examples of those early on in the presentation, and those are being paid for by the... Uh, um, um, by the health, health companies. We have to go through uh, often a pre-approval process, just like we do with other expensive therapies. But um, I, I think uh, the, the conversations I've seen or been involved in, I think people realize the transformative uh, effects of this therapy. And I think uh, um, they really want to uh, bring these therapies to their um, to their their clients and the, and their their populate their population of patients they serve, but I think what we have to remember is that um, you know ultimately who pays for gene therapy is uh, oftentimes these are you know companies that ha might have fifty employees or a hundred employees and maybe one uh, family within that who's affected by hemophilia and uh, you know a therapy that might cost two or three million dollars that can um, that can be a big challenge in those settings so i i think there will be lots of innovative um, alternatives for payment that will ensure again that those barriers aren't aren't um, you know insurmountable and the maximum number of patients will be able to be offered it um, what, what was the second part of that question you wanted me to address? Um, about HTCs. Is it oh, going to be yeah. available at all oh, yeah. HTCs well, or will it just be certain ones? Yeah, yeah. Well, let me, let me tell you. Um, you know, this was entitled Gene Therapy Getting Up to Speed. I could have done a very similar presentation um, to talk to my colleagues at, at the HTCs. We've all got to get up to speed. Um, I would say right now, no. Um, there's no way that this is going to be offered right out of the gate at all HTCs. Almost certainly there will be centers who either they started out participating in the trials and they have good experience and have overcome all their institutional hurdles to be able to be ready to develop, deliver this therapy. And in the early days, maybe those are the centers that are doing some of the initial wave of commercial gene therapy. But there's lots of centers who just didn't participate in the clinical trials who I think are more than capable of getting ready and getting up to speed in a short period of time. And hopefully what we'll see at a minimum is that within every region, we're going to have at least one or a handful of centers who are equipped to do this. They can do the initial infusion. And then hopefully the host, uh, the home HTC could then do the main follow-up of the patient after the infusion. Okay. 
Okay. I'm going to finish off with two questions. Um, first off, what do you think is the ideal candidate for gene therapy? Well, it's interesting you ask that because the very first patient that I enrolled on a clinical trial for gene therapy was 68 years old. And uh, I also have a patient who was uh, uh, just a few uh, days, if not weeks, past his 18th birthday um, eligible to participate. Um, I have patients who have extensive uh, history of uh, joint disease who are keen to uh, participate. And then I have uh, young guys who've been on primary prophylaxis their whole lives, really don't have any target joints, and they just want to be liberated from prophylaxis and be able to live their lives. So is there an ideal candidate? I would say everyone with severe hemophilia, this is this is potentially an option for them. Um, uh, this is gonna be a shared decision-making between them and their clinicians. And uh, I think everyone needs to take advantage of as much educational information around this. I hope I was able to contribute at least a, a modicum of, of um, uh, insight for people uh, today that will help uh, catalyze some of their discussions with their clinicians at home. Um, but yeah, the more we're informed, uh, we'll be able to identify who those ideal candidates are. Okay. And the last is, uh, when do you see this going into the younger um, age group? You know, under eighteen. Yeah, it, it's going to start with under clinical trials. Um, I, I believe uh, very soon you're going to see some of the clinical trial programs expanding into. Um, uh, older adolescents. I think we all accept that there probably isn't much different about the physiology of the liver in a 16 or a 17 year old or maybe even a 14 or 15 year old. So I think um, the, the regulators have asked the companies to concentrate on the adults first. Um, but in discussions with the regulators, I believe we'll see some studies that will open up into progressively younger uh, individuals. The reason we're not doing this in very young pediatric patients is their, their livers are still dividing when they're quite young. And uh, because of the AV platform, it, it's not a primarily integrating uh, uh, vector system. Um, if we did this too early, um, eventually it would all be diluted out because of the dividing cells of the liver in a young patient. So if we're going to do gene therapy in young pediatric patients, it's probably going to be a different platform than this one. Okay. All right. Well, I'm closing the, um, the polling and putting it up for everybody to see. You should be able to see that the vast majority of people feel that um, they do have a better understanding of gene therapy after participating in this webinar. So thank you very much, Dr. Pipe, um, for sharing uh, your knowledge, your expertise. Um, it was invaluable. Uh, the biggest concern for everyone is safety. And obviously, the more information we get from things such as this, as well as through clinical trials, the um, better we all will be. Um, for those of you who we were not able to get to your questions, we will submit these to Dr. Pipe, and um, we will try to get them back to you as long as we have your email address. So if you can go back into the q and A, I'll leave it open for just a few minutes and put in your email address. We'll be um, sure to get that back to you. But otherwise, we're going to let you go. Uh, a copy of this, just as a reminder, um, the uh, recording will be available at hemophilia.org and uh, under future therapies. So thank you, everyone, for your time tonight. And thank you again, Dr. Pipe. Um, for an excellent presentation and um, for taking the time to answer everybody's questions. With All that, right. we're going to let you go. All right. Good night, everyone. Good night.